There we go. Update on the CubeSat. So I haven't talked for a little while about the about the UVA CubeSat project, which is actually UVA, Virginia Tech, Old Dominion, and Hampton CubeSat project. Um, as you may recall, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech, and Old Dominion each built a 1U CubeSat that's a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, and um, all designed and built by students. Uh, I volunteered to, to help with the ground station and general radio stuff uh, for the University of Virginia part of the project. And a lot has happened since the last time I gave you an update. Uh, first thing that happened was we put the antenna on the roof of mechanical and aerospace engineering. That was an interesting project. Uh, access to the roof is via um, uh, metal ladder bolted to the wall, which means the antenna had to be completely assembled on the ground and hoisted up onto the roof. So that's the uh, non-penetrating roof mount and tower going up. And uh, some of you rep recognize yeah, it's, it's Gordon's best angle, really. <laughs> uh, Gordon WW4GW very ki kindly uh, volunteered to come out and do the rigging, and he donated a bunch of um, heliacs and was just generally very helpful on the project. Uh, so we got the antenna up. Uh, we went through the process uh, called integration. Students went down to Houston to NanoRacks, uh, which is the integrator and deployer. Uh, there are several ways to get it to get a CubeSat into space. Uh, they all involve uh, being put into what amounts to a tube with a spring at one end and a door at the other. And, uh, and so the spring is back there, and the door comes up in front. This is not actually the deployer. This is this is. This is the thing at the airport that you put your carry-on luggage in to make sure that it fits. Uh, you have to slide it in here first. I'll show you a picture of the, the dispenser in a minute. But uh, this is the UVA CubeSat, uh, ready to go. And uh, this is the dispenser. This is actually a movie. We'll see if I can get it started. Um, how do I do this? and lock it. This is the door in front that pops open when you're in space, and the, uh, uh, the spring is back here. There's enough room for four 1U CubeSats uh, in, in each of these tubes made by this outfit called NanoRacks, which does the integration and, and deployment. Um, whoops, next slide. And then we launched. So uh, the, typically there are two ways to get to space. For if you have a CubeSat. One way is uh, direct deployment from the launch vehicle. Uh, they basically tuck one or more of these dispensers into the nooks and crannies on the booster stages, typically the second stage. And after the second stage has fired and, and the primary payload, the, whoever's actually paying for the launch, is deployed and clear and out of danger, then they open the doors and they pop the CubeSats out. The second way is to go to the space station, <clears throat> to go uh, for a ride as cargo, along with the uh, Tang and the, and the uh, I, think, uh, I think they sent Easter dinner up with us, as I recall. Uh, so there was probably some ham involved. Uh, but um, we went to the space station. So we went up as cargo on the Cygnus Antares, on the Antares rocket, the Cygnus cargo vehicle. Uh, this was the first time that living creatures had gone up on the Cygnus. They sent a bunch of mice up. And uh, it, it's, it's really funny. If you're interested in space exploration, go on YouTube and search for uh, Cygnus mice space station or something like that. And uh, what you will find is a video that shows the mice uh, like 12 hours after they got to the space station and then again uh, 36 hours after they got to the space station. And 12 hours, they're clinging to the cage, going sort of hand over hand, rung to rung around the cage. And then a day later, they're going <laughs> run, you know, floating through space. They're having a ball. So mice were, were on there with us. And whoops, that's what it looks like when it's being grabbed. So they grab it with the uh, Canadian arm and, uh, and spin it around and dock it with the space station. Then they unload. And then the uh, 
cargo like uh, like CubeSats sits around for a while. We sat on the space station for six or seven <coughs> weeks, something like that, before we got scheduled. And then one day we got a message saying you've been scheduled for the work period on the 3rd of July and uh, expect to deploy on one of the orbits in the morning of the 3rd. We were supposed to deploy at about 9.30. Um, and, um, <laughs> and they had to reboot the server. And so they put us off till the next orbit. But we ended up deploying at about, uh, about quarter to 11, something like that. And um, there's a couple of students on the project. Uh, li you know, everything NASA does, you get all these great live feeds, and there they go. So this, this is a bunch of those things that you saw the CubeSats being put into. They can bolt a bunch of them together. So that I think there were a dozen, about a dozen CubeSats deployed on the morning that we deployed. And they do them in bunches. They did one, the orbit before we were supposed to deploy. And then, uh, of course, they missed the orbit where we were supposed to deploy. Then they did our three. And then there were more later on throughout the day for a total of, I think, 11, actually, 11. Um, and this is what it looks like. Is it running? So this is a, a time lapse of the high resolution photos that the astronauts took. One of the astronauts was at a window with a, with a Nikon uh, SLR, digital SLR taking, uh, you know, with finger down on the button and uh, got these really great high resolution photos. That's us in the middle. Uh, Virginia Tech got to go first, and uh, no, I'm sorry, that's Old Dominion up in front. That's Tech in the back, and um, and the photographs are high, such high resolution that you can actually blow them up. For example, we 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 uh, zoomed in to see if each of the satellites has three kill switches on the on the end. So when the satellites are all packed into the tube, the switches are depressed to keep the satellites powered down. And uh, when they're dispensed, then those switches open, and the, uh, a 30-minute timer starts so your satellite doesn't power up close to the space station just in case it blows up. And, um, and so we could actually look and see whether those, switch, whether those little plungers popped out. That was really, really cool. I mean, where? I'm sorry. Where? Oh, you know what? I missed the fun part. I missed the fun part. Can't miss this. So Cygnus launch vehicle. Uh, this is the Cygnus being loaded and prepared for launch. The fairing being put on. Uh, the Antares rocket with Cygnus up here in the in the nose cone being taken out to the launch pad. This was at Wallops Island on the eastern shore, uh, next to near Chincoteague. Uh, very pretty. You were there, right? Yeah, I, I got to go out for the launch. It was a lot of fun. It was my first in-person <laughs> launch. So we were about two miles from the launch pad, and uh, all the folks who had basically there was a viewing site for every anybody who had payload on the on the launch. We got to be the closest, and uh, and it was very impressive. You could feel it. it felt all of your innards rumble. So I knew I'd missed something really fun there. Um, when did they get off? I'm sorry? When did that rocket get launched? Uh, the launch was in April. <clears throat> I think I was down there and had to tour to the building uh, where they were loading the, the uh, big campaign. Okay, cool. Yeah, they do, they do all of the loading and, and final integration right there uh, at, at the Virginia Spaceport. It's a very impressive facility. 
So uh, deployed, so this is a good news, no news story. So that was uh, Tuesday last week, the third. Tuesday, no, Wednesday was the third. Um, we haven't made contact yet. Uh, we all assumed that we'd make contact right away. In fact, none of us has made contact. Uh, so uh, our current theory, which we are clinging to like, like people who are drowning cling to a life preserver, uh, we have not yet gotten the orbital parameters from the Air Force folks who track all of the stuff in low Earth orbit. Uh, they took some time off for the holiday. Some of them were busy with something going on up in D.C. And uh, so basically they were on a skeleton staff at, uh, at, the, um, uh, at the tracking center. And so they're running a little bit behind getting our, our orbital elements out to us. So uh, what we keep telling ourselves is we're pointing the antenna at the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's why we haven't made contact. And as soon as we get those orbital parameters and we can point the antenna at the right spot, uh, then everything's going to work perfectly. So that's what I keep telling myself. The alternative is unpleasant. So uh, uh, these satellites, all three of our satellites are communicating using, uh, there is a little bit of amateur radio here, standard 9600 baud um, packet, AX25 packet. So it's the same thing you do 1200 baud for APRS and Winlink and all that sort of stuff. There is a 9600 uh, baud version of that and that's what we're using for the, for the uplink, uplink and downlink. Um, and that's what it looks like. It's, uh, uh, at 9600 baud, the, modul the modulation is not frequency shift keying. It's what's called GMSK, Gaussian minimum shift keying. Uh, the idea is to, uh, you do all sorts of math mathematical munging of the, of the packet before you transmit it to spread the energy out across the, the bandwidth and the minimum shift keying part of it. It's frequency shift keying, except you always change in phase. It's actually phase shift keying. And you always shift in phase, so there are no phase discontinuities, which reduces the sidebands. It keeps the noise down, so it, uh, it's a technique for, for uh, keeping your signal within the um, allocated bandwidth. And that's what it looks like. And the square thing is not the signal. Uh, that's, that's what's called a mask. Uh, basically, it's the set of set of parameters that you agree not to exceed. We had to, we had to tell the FCC uh, no more than so many dB at these frequencies. That's called a, a frequency mass or a spectrum mass. OK, um, questions about CubeSats? So uh, each of these CubeSats, this is the first student built CubeSat for all three universities. Uh, the primary goal is to do it. Uh, the second, every, every uh, mission that's funded by NASA has to have uh, what, what they refer to as the science component. Uh, our science component, each of our three CubeSats has an outrageously expensive GPS receiver on it. Uh, the GPS receivers cost five grand a piece. Uh, this is a really fine GPS receiver. And um, uh, any, anytime you put space rated in front of something, it multiplies the cost by about a factor of 10. So uh, these GPS receivers are taking very, very accurate uh, measurements. We, we tell ourselves they're up there taking measurements right now, waiting to send the data to us, of their position in space and the time when they were at that position. And the students are going to use that data to very, very precisely calculate the orbits of the spacecraft and compare that with the expected orbit to look at uh, atmospheric drag. The idea is to, to figure out what, how much atmosphere is there in low Earth orbit right now, and how does that depend on other things. So you know we're interested in sunspots because it helps with propagation. Uh, satellites are interested in sunspots because uh, when the sun is more active, the atmosphere expands. The atmosphere heats up, and there's more air in low Earth orbit, which means everything in low Earth orbit is subject to more drag. And for things that need to stay up there, like space station, that means they have to burn more fuel to push the space station back up, because the space station always wants to come back down. That would be bad. 
And so every once in a while they do a, a, a they've got some ro little rockets on the space station and they burn those rockets to, to reestablish their orbit. Uh, we're just going to come back when we come back. In fact, the ODU spacecraft is going to come back early. They have drag brakes on theirs, which they will deploy at some point. Um, and they will actually try to re-enter more quickly. Uh, but uh, so the, the science part is measuring very precisely the orbits and, and therefore the atmospheric drag and looking to correlate that with things like solar activity and other stuff. So I'm sorry. Uh, Ham went up first. That was the same question. Oh, same question. Uh, uh, again, it depends on what the sun decides to do, uh, but uh, we should be up there at least nine months. Could be as long as two years. Uh, these things are solar powered, and um, uh, so it, as long as they stay up, we'll keep talking to them and, and downlinking data. Anybody else on that one? All right. Thank you for indulging me. This has been a really, really fun project. and. Um, uh, we're really hoping that the next one, we're, we're, we're in the preliminary design phase for the next mission that UVA is going to undertake, uh, which will be a, a larger spacecraft. It'll be 3U, so 30 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And uh, it will have a, a spectrometer, an imaging spectrometer, which is being designed and prototyped by the astronomy department uh, to look at nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide concentrations in several major cities around the world. Uh, the idea being um, from low Earth orbit, there, there are geosynchronous uh, remote sensing satellites that are looking at nitrogen dioxide, but, but their pixels, their sample sizes are uh, like 50 kilometer <coughs> squares on the ground because they're so far away. We'll be in low Earth orbit. We won't be able to look at the whole surface of the Earth on a regular basis like the geosynchronous satellites can uh, look at the at Northern uh, North America, anyway, um, but we'll be a whole lot closer. So our pixels are going to be on the order of a kilometer. So we should be actually be able to see roads and factories and that kind of stuff. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is one of the major components of uh, tailpipe emissions on cars. So uh, we should be able to see the freeways in Los Angeles. So that's a neat project. And we're really hoping that that will go up on an amateur radio license. We got caught in this mess with the FCC rethinking uh, licensing for these small satellites. And they decided that um, this was a part of the educational process. The university's business is education. The faculty are paid to teach. Therefore, this is a commercial activity. No more amateur radio. Uh, after many, many years of fruitful partnership between HAMS and universities, on these satellites. Uh, a big stink was raised about that. The FCC has backed down. They're rethinking about it. They're thinking about it again. And we're hopeful. I'm talking with the folks at AMSAT uh, really early for the next one. Uh, they're interested in partnering with us. And, uh, and we're hopeful that the next one will, will go up on an amateur radio license, probably W4UVA. And, um, and we'll have an amateur radio payload. So 